Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Backyard Mission. My name is Yuri Deming with Inside the Outdoors. And today we have another friend from Inside the Outdoors. Hannah Morse is joining us today. Hannah, go ahead and say hello. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with you guys this afternoon. Thank you, Hannah. And we are very excited to join you once again. Now, our Backyard Mission series was developed so you can take a look at things that are in your own neighborhood, make those observations on the really cool phenomena that you find right outside your door. For one of the first episode, we focused on birds, what type of local birds we have in Orange County. Then we also focused on nighttime animals, nocturnal animals in Orange County. And we also learned about the stars and how we're able to stargaze and look at some of the constellations that are right above us. So today, we're going to focus on a different theme and we're going to talk a little bit about weather. So a couple of reminders for our show today uh, because we are on YouTube. So welcome everyone that's joining us live on YouTube. And if you're watching this recording later, I'm glad that you're able to watch us. But the chat function is open for you. So if you have any questions, if you have answers, comments, please make sure that you're putting them in the chat. And our friend, Mrs. Brown, is monitoring the chat like she has in the previous episodes. And she's going to go ahead and pass them to us as we move forward. For each episode, we've also had a guest speaker that ties into the theme. So we had some a biologist uh, when we were talking about birds. We had the planetarium director when we were talking about the stars. We had a park ranger when we talked about nocturnal animals. And for today's episode, we had a really good friend of mine. Seth Whitaker, who is joining us from UC Davis. Now, I've had the pleasure of knowing Seth for a few years now. I was able to work with him when he attended Laguna Hills High School, and he was the president of the Gardening Club. So we had a couple of different projects that we worked together with Inside the Outdoors and his club. So he is joining us live today. Seth, go, go ahead and say hello. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, perfect. Thank you, Seth. Now, first of all, Seth, can you let us know where you are calling in from and what school you are currently attending? Yeah, so I'm calling in from actually the city of Davis. I live in West Davis, and I'm attending the University of California at Davis. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Now, what's great about having you on this call today, Seth, is I want a lot of the students that are tuning in today to hear from a college student. Okay, to hear about your path, uh, maybe what made you choose the classes that you're currently taking. Um, and also what I found really fascinating is the job that you currently have at school. So why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what is your major, first question, and what type of job are you doing while attending UC Davis? Yeah, so I'm an atmospheric science major, which means that I study clouds and water and everything that has to do with that. And I'm currently working as a student observer at the UC Davis Climate Station, which is, which is run cooperatively with NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. What a very fascinating job that you have. Now, Seth, do me a favor, tell all of our friends that are watching now, how old is that weather station that you visit and you work at? So my job and the way we've been doing my job has been around since 1931, so 90 years this year. But the weather station itself has actually been around since 1871, which means that it'll be 150 years old this year. Wow. That, that's amazing to hear that the weather station has been around that long and that your job has been around for 90 years, you know, to make those observations, which is what this series is all about, right? Making observations on the phenomena that's all around us. So let's get into a little bit about your job that you have at, at school. Um, first question, Seth, is why did you choose this job in college? Well, 
first of all, I mean, it fits in exactly with my major and career goals and all of that, which is great. And one of the one of the really nice things about college is <laughs> is this sounds funny, but the email lists, because when you're within your department, whatever you're studying, you get you get added to lists where they'll send out jobs. And in late October, uh, I got an email that the one of the former student observers was retiring and they needed an observer right away. So I I emailed back and I had to answer um, my what year I was in, which I'm a freshman, uh, what I was studying, atmospheric science, and then how I would get to the weather station if it were freezing rain, uh, 30 degrees, and there was a zombie apocalypse happening. Um, so it's it was really convenient because it's close to where I live, and it's a really amazing way to get hands-on experience in the field of climate science. That's fantastic. You know, that's something that I didn't realize that you should be able to get to the weather station no matter what type of weather is happening. So that that's really interesting that you shared that. Um, so quick, um, if you can let us know, what's a typical day at your job look like? So when you're able to go up to the weather station, what does that day look like for you? Yeah, so we take we take two kinds of measurements at the, well, kind of three, but two. We take manual measurements. So we use, we have two mercury thermometers. Um, one shows the highest temperature of the previous day, and then the other shows the lowest temperature and the current temperature. So we take that. And then we have what's called an evaporation pan, which is a big tub of water that with a little, uh, measuring stick in it so we record how much water's evaporated the previous day and then when it does rain we have a precipitation gauge which is basically just a big metal tube that we take a stick or a stick called a dip stick that when you put it in the water it uh it gets dark up to the how much rain there was and then we look at electronic measurements for all of those things plus water temperature and we also record uh, soil temperature and then we also have to take some what are called qualitative measurements. So no numbers involved, but we just have to look at the sky and say whether it's clear or cloudy or scattered clouds or rainy or foggy or any of the other conditions it could be. Well, that's perfect because that's exactly what we're telling all of our friends joining us today is how to make those observations just by either going outside, looking up in the sky or looking outside your window. Um, you know, talking about your typical day, is there a certain experiment or duty that you have that you feel is maybe the favorite part? Ooh, well, there are some interesting, I mean, it's, the whole thing is always an experiment because the weather is always changing. So, um, that's just fun in and of itself. And we... There are always fun issues we run into, like we that evaporation pan that's a big pan of water. Sometimes our measurements will get messed up because we have a coyote who lives in the field next to us who will come in and drink from our e-pan. Um, so all of those kinds of things that it's impossible to predict. We also do have on the property, we have some uh, UV ultraviolet radiation sensors that NASA actually put there when they were testing um, some of their satellites. So we have to maintain those and spray those down. And then I don't do this right now because it's we take the measurements every Tuesday, but we have the National Aerosol Deposition Program. We have a measuring site for that, which basically means that we have a white Home Depot bucket that we use to collect all the dust and particles that fall down and come from it raining. And so then we do that once a week and mail that off to Wisconsin. So those are some of the kind of ongoing <laughs> experiments that we have at the weather station. That That's really cool. I mean, the fact that you're able to look at all these different factors and observing the weather in your area, um, you know, the the evaporation pan, I mean, that that's super cool that you're taking those measurements. And so, you know, with you doing all these different types of experiments and making those observations and collecting that data, are there any requirements for the job that you have? Um, well, 
being a student at UC Davis or any university, really, because there are a lot of other universities that run weather stations because it's part of the part of NOAA's cooperative observer program. But really, the the actual work that I'm doing would only require maybe a high school degree. It's pretty simple math. And in a lot of cases, there are jobs with the federal government like uh, hydrographic technicians, for instance, which is also related to water. They look at uh, stream gauges, so how high or low a river is. And a lot of those jobs with the federal government only require high school degrees. So kind of contrary to a lot of science where you feel like you might need a PhD or all sorts of experience, there are a lot of hands-on jobs in clouds and water where you really only need a high school degree. But most weather forecasting, you need a bachelor's degree, so four years of college. Thank you for sharing that information. That's good for everyone to know what type of requirements are needed. Let me ask you a question. As you are a student at UC Davis with a job that you have, are there any classes that you're currently taking or plan to take that you feel might help you in the job that you're doing? Yeah, so overall, I'm doing uh, a lot of math and science, particularly chemistry and physics, are really integral to the job. But I'm also taking our atmospheric science department has a class on severe and unusual weather, which only requires uh, high school physics. And that's a really fun class. Um, yeah. Now, would you say that's one of your favorite classes in college? Or do you have a favorite class that you uh, are currently taking? Yeah, I would, I would have to say that the atmospheric science one is really interesting. Um, I've been, one of the nice things that UC Davis and a lot of other schools offer too are different like seminars for first years. So not even particularly related to my major, but I've been working on a research seminar with a professor where we're looking at the <laughs> Codex Alimentarius, which is a United Nations organization that uh, regulates food labeling and whatnot. So I've been doing some research on that. That's completely different from my major, but it's really interesting stuff. And, and seeing that you're doing all this research, you know, whether it's weather related or, you know, like you mentioned right now, the different types of research, you know, going back to high school, you know, seeing that you're a freshman in college, were there classes in high school that were your favorite that maybe helped you choose your major and the current job that you have now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really, I really enjoyed math and physics, in particular, while I was in high school. Um, and environmental science, too. A lot of schools have AP environmental science, my high school did. Um, so all of those are really interesting. I also really did enjoy history. And I, I love school. So I really did enjoy history and English and all those too, which definitely have a part, right? Because you can't, you can't write a research paper um, without being able to write, period. So it, it all it all does kind of play a role in in any job. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, you know, I think taking your overall educational experience is important, right? Um, you know, going back to your job, you know, seeing all the measurements that you're taking, the experiments that you're observing, you know, what you're doing at the weather station is, is amazing. Is it changing often where you're having to go back and get new skills in the job that you have? Well, it's actually, it is interesting because there are definitely, there have been changes we've had to make over the years, not necessarily while I've been there, but there are issues where like, we used to record a wet bulb, which is a, a wet bulb measurements measure how humid the air is. And uh, at some point, somewhat recently, we figured out that the, the instruments we used to use for measuring wet bulb are really inaccurate. So we that's actually no longer something we take measurements of. And we've had, uh, at the weather station too, we've moved around what instrument we use to measure wind. So like now, now our little anemometer, which are the they have little cups on the end and they spin around and tell you how fast the wind is. Our anemometer now is actually right behind the E-pan. 
So it's, <laughs> which sometimes causes issues because any winds from the north are blocked by the EPAN. But we definitely have, we're always trying to update our technology to make sure that it's, it's the best we can use. But then we also, like a lot of our manual, um, uh, our manual equipment has been around since before the 60s because we want to continue to take the same kind of readings as we have since the 30s so that the, it, the information is valuable and kind of the same. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that information. I mean, I know that, you know, with weather changing as often as it does and, you know, new equipment coming in, you know, that's something that maybe new skills are needed to adapt to whatever is being brought in. But, you know, seeing that your job is all related to water, which is our theme for today, you know, you're a student observer, which is exactly what we're asking students, you know, to, to do is observe. Um, and you're a resident, you know, you're, you're from Orange County, which we're talking to Orange County students right now. Are there any tips that you can share for people that are, for kids that are watching, okay, on how to better observe the weather from their home? Yeah, one thing, I mean, one thing I wish I'd done that I think would be really interesting is just to start, start a notebook of maybe at the same time every day. We take the measurements at 8 a.m. every day, but you don't necessarily have to take it that <laughs> early. You could take three in the afternoon um, or whenever school gets out, but you just take, you know, note down what the sky looks like. We have there are obviously all the different ways to identify clouds, but we even do really easy. We say it's clear if less than 10% of the sky is covered by clouds. Uh, scattered clouds if 10 to 50% of the sky is covered. Broken if it's 50 to 90 and overcast if it's greater than 90%. So you can even use really big categories um, to identify, but yeah, just maybe start start a notebook of like what how cloudy it is if it's if it even if it feels hot or cold or lukewarm um and and anything you notice too obviously there are all sorts of fancy even home ways to measure the weather but you really don't need any instruments or really even any math um you can take just kind of qualitative observations about what the outside weather's like Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great tip. You know, science journals are something that we definitely want to encourage students to uh, to have, right? Taking those notes down, same time every day, over time, going back and, you know, making those comparisons. So thank you for sharing that tip. And Seth, I really want to thank you for joining us today on this call. I really appreciate you sharing your experience with your current job, uh, your college experience and major. And hopefully maybe this is something that a student that's watching can think to themselves, oh, you know what, I'm fascinated by the weather. I'm interested in observing. Maybe that's something they could do. So thank you for joining us today, Seth. Oh, absolutely. Thank you all for having me. All right, so that was my friend Seth Whitaker joining us from UC Davis. And you know, it, it ties in great to what we're talking about today, which is the weather, uh, making those observations, and I don't know about you, but I have a favorite type of weather. And usually for me, my favorite type of weather, it's when it's a little bit cloudy and sunny at the same time. So each Seth even mentioned it earlier, so scattered clouds. So let's talk about some of the clouds you might observe right outside your window. Now, as I'm looking outside my window, I don't see many clouds today, but doesn't mean that there's not gonna be clouds later in the week, right? So something you might notice are clouds that are called cumulus clouds. So those are those big puffy clouds scattered, okay? As they get taller, you might notice that there's some shade underneath um, because they're blocking out the sun. So the cumulus clouds are common on those scattered cloudy days, uh, can make it a little bit cooler. That's my favorite type of weather is when you see those cumulus clouds. And when you have those clouds completely take over the sky, so sometimes you call that an overcast day, it's really gray outside. That's when we're looking at stratus clouds, okay? So stratus clouds is kind of like that blanket of clouds over the sky, right? So some people really like the cloudy day. Uh, maybe they prefer when it's cooler temperature, putting that jacket on. Uh, because I like to get outdoors, I like to hike, it's a great time to go hiking is when it's nice and cool in Orange County. So that's the stratus clouds when it's covering that sky. And then when you have those stratus clouds, 
uh, bring down some of that weather, then you have the nimbus stratus clouds, which you can see how much darker this picture is. So that's when you can have some rain, some snow coming down from those clouds. So again, with our weather currently, you know, one week we might get a little bit of rain, and then the next week it's, you know, mid-70s, a little bit warmer. So you might see that change with those clouds. As the clouds get up higher in the atmosphere, it's a lot colder up there. So you might notice clouds that look like this, the cirrus clouds. Now what's really cool about these clouds is they're so high up in the air, it's really cold, so they're really just ice crystals that are kind of floating around. Um, it looks kind of really faint like hair, right, like fur, um, almost looks like a feather in the sky. And it's a great way to observe the direction that the weather is either going or coming from, which is the cirrus clouds. And one thing that all these clouds have in common, of course, is water. So water is what's forming all of these clouds. And a process that you might be aware of is something that might look like this, which is our water cycle. So evaporation is a huge part of what's making these clouds. And my friend Seth actually mentioned that they measure the evaporation by gauging and measuring the water in that pan, right? So these arrows kind of show you that in this stream here, the water evaporates. That's because that's due from the heat of the sun. And as they go up in the sky, there's particles in the air that could be dust or smoke or pollen. And so the water is attaching itself to those particles. And as they're more and more are getting together, then that's when you have these clouds form. Then you get that precipitation, which could be rain or snow or hail or sleet coming back down. And that process just continues. That's why it's called a cycle, right? So it's really important to understand uh, why Seth is mentioning all those measurements that they're taking, the evaporation, the humidity, the amount of water that's in the air. And we can't see that. So the water vapor, you can't see it, but it's all around us. And that's what's forming these clouds over here. Now, talking about these clouds is great, but I mentioned that we have another friend from inside the outdoors, Hannah, that is joining us today. And Hannah is actually gonna go through a model of an experiment where you can see how clouds are actually formed. And this is an experiment that you could do from your own house, okay? So she's gonna go through some of the materials and walk through the steps of this experiment. So Hannah, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to you and you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yareeb, for informing us about the water cycle and the different clouds that we can see in our sky. So as he was saying, I want to take a closer look at how clouds are formed. And what better way to do that than to perform an experiment? Now today, we are going to form a cloud in a jar. And this experiment is very simple. As Yareeb was saying, it's something that you guys can do at your own homes with your family. Um, but you want to make sure that you have some parental supervision because it does involve hot water. So let's take a look at the equipment that I'm going to use to carry out this experiment. So we have our glass jar. And along with that, you're going to want a metal lid. Now I have a mason jar and this came with a metal lid. But if you don't have a metal lid, you can use a metal python like this one here to place on top and cover your jar. I also have some ice cubes with us in our little cooler here. And I do have some hot water. And lastly, I have some hairspray. But before we get started on our experiment, I want to do a quick review of how clouds are formed and to do that, we are going to use these two cups right here. Let me make sure you guys can see them in my screen here. All right, so I have this glass that's full of water at room temperature. And I also have this one that's full of cold ice water. I want you to observe these two glasses. Maybe there's a difference between these two. So let's focus on the one with this cold ice water. Go ahead and reply in the chat. What do you notice on the outside of this glass with ice in it? Miss Brown will be waiting for your observations to come in. And while we wait, I'll give you some time to get a closer look. What do you notice on the outside of this glass with ice in it? 
It looks like I can draw in it. So I also want you to start wondering how it might have got there, because this is the same way that clouds are formed. All right, so you have some different observations that are coming in. Kate says that it's something called condensation. Uh, Julia describes that it looks like it's foggy, and Cherry Blossom is saying that it has water around it. Great observation, scientists. So this is water that is collecting on the outside of our glass. And you were right, this is called condensation. So I wanted you to wonder where this moisture was even coming from. And I don't think it's coming from the inside of this glass cup because it is glass and there are no holes in it. So that's how we know that it's coming from the air all around us. There's water everywhere in the air, even more so on humid days. But we can't see it because it's in the form of vapor. And when the vapor comes and touches the cold glass, it begins to condense and turn back into liquid. And so how you might want be wondering, does this relate to clouds? So it relates to clouds because as we go up, up, up into the atmosphere, into the sky, it gets really cold, just like the outside of our cold water cup. And the colder it gets, the water vapor will start to condense around tiny particles in the sky like dust, pollen, or smoke. And the more condensation that occurs, the more clouds we see. So now that we have reviewed how clouds are formed, let's get back to our experiment. So let me move these out of the way and get set up for our experiment. So this experiment is performed pretty quick, so that's why it's important to have all of our equipment ready and close by before we start. So that's why we went over our equipment list in the beginning. So first, I'm going to take my metal lid and I'm going to place ice on top of it. And I'm doing this so that it gets really cold and we have it ready for when we need to put it on top of our jar. <laughs> Now I'm going to take our glass jar and pour some hot water into the bottom of it. There we go, I think that's enough. Now I'm also going to take our hairspray and this hairspray is what's gonna resemble the dust, pollen, or smoke that's up in the sky to give our water vapor something to condense on. But this step has to be done quick, so that's why I have our metal lid with ice on it ready to go. We want to trap these particles inside our jar. So let me go ahead and do this step really quickly for you guys to see. All right, so the reason why we wanted to have ice on top of our metal lid is so that as the water vapor starts to rise and it hits this cool surface, it begins to condense. So I want you guys to observe and watch this cloud form within our jar. And I'm as we wait for our cloud to form, I want to hear from you guys. So go ahead and please respond in our chat. What do you think will happen when I take this lid off of our jar? Will the cloud disappear or will it rise and float around my room? Miss Brown will be watching the chat for your predictions. So what do you think will happen to our cloud that is forming in our jar when I take the lid off? Will it disappear or will it hang around and float around my room? So as we're waiting for our predictions to come in, I have um, someone whose username is Purple who said, I think what's going to happen is the ice is going to sizzle. And this was a prediction before you asked about the cloud. So great wonderings that are happening. Um, Cherry Blossom says that she thinks it will be a bit smoky. 
um, why Jane Monkey says, I think the smoke like closet will come out and disappear. I see some disappearing, exploding with air. I think it'll start forming clouds and it will be trapped inside. Um, so a lot of just foggy and smoky observations. We have um, somebody predicting that it might float around. I guess we'll have to see. I love your predictions and the words you are using to describe what you think is going to happen. So let's go ahead and take a look when I take this lid off of the jar. Watch closely. So it looks like the cloud hangs around for a little bit and then it begins to disappear. So this kind of reminds me of fog. So fog is actually a really low cloud. Imagine a cold, foggy morning, and then when what happens when the sun starts to come up? Everything warms up and the fog disappears. So the condensed water vapor that forms the fog gets a little bit too hot and begins to evaporate. So that's why our cloud disappeared here from our jar. It's a little bit too warm in my room for this cloud to hang around with us. But that's okay. It was amazing to see the cloud form right in front of our eyes. So I hope that you guys get a chance to perform this experiment yourself at home with your family and maybe eventually with some friends. But remember to have some parental supervision as well. All right, let's check back in with your read. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah. I am all about experiments, especially experiments you can do at home. It was really cool to see um, that, you know, the materials that you use, you know, could be found at home, right? Some hairspray, if you have a jar, some ice. Uh, but if you remember what Seth was saying, you know, these are great ways for you to compare the experiment that you just did at home with your family or friends, compare it to what you're observing outside. Compare it as the weather is changing. What's happening to those clouds, okay? Is it on a warm day? What time of the year are you seeing more clouds? Is it now that we're in February? Are you gonna see more in April? Uh, that's why another great tip that Seth mentioned was that notebook, that science journal where you're making those observations, you're, you're jotting down, and any wonderings that you might have, right? Any questions where you're like, I wonder what would happen if, write that down. Maybe you, you're gonna find that answer the more you're making those observations at home. Um, now, before we finish up today, I want to make sure, Mrs. Brown, are there any other questions, comments, observations that are out there that we have not had a chance to answer? Uh, yeah, there was a question earlier about what causes um, hail to become large within a cloud before it falls down. That's a great question. So as I mentioned in the water cycle, you have all those water vapors that are you know, hanging on to the particles of dust and clouds. It really has to do with the temperature. Now, if you think of our atmosphere, think about space from where you are right now up into outer space. The higher you go up, the colder it's gonna be. So depending on that temperature around, it's what's gonna freeze that water and turn it into hail as it comes down. Now in Southern California, in Orange County, we don't get much hail. Um, there's also a mixture of water and hail, which could be sleet, okay? So think about that. So think of it where it's like frozen water that's coming down, right? Um, but again, it just depends on where you're living in the country, where in the United States, uh, what type of weather you're getting, because it can change. Even from where Seth was calling from at UC Davis to Southern California, there could be a difference in that weather that's being observed. So great question. Um, as our weather changes these next coming weeks, you know, that's a great time to write down any observations because we did get hail not too long ago in Orange County. So I don't know if you remember that we did get some cold, cold weather. And if it's really cold and that condensation happens and that it's getting really heavy, those water vapors, it's going to come back down. That's when we had that hail. So thanks for sharing that, Mrs. Brown. Anything else that's out there that we can uh, either answer or any comments that it want, people want to share? Uh, there's a question about um, uh, how do storm and thunderstorms happen from Julia? So that's a really good question. So what's happening is, you know, as we're getting the, the clouds being formed, you know, there's one type of cloud that I did not mention, which is the cumulonimbus clouds right there. 
okay? And as you can see, the more water vapors that are gathering, okay, the taller that those clouds are being formed, the more water vapors, the more condensation, you see how dark it is. These are storm clouds right here, okay? So it really depends on the weather of the day, the time of the year, uh, the amount of water vapors, the condensation that's happening, the evaporation that's happening. So because, as an example, you know, the, the sun at the equator is going to be the strongest. So that's really where they get a lot of thunderstorms around uh, rainforests, uh, around the equator because of that bright sun. So that, that evaporation is really important. So what people may not realize is one of the most important things in this whole process, we're talking about clouds, we're talking about water, is the sun. Because without that heat, you don't have that evaporation. Okay, and then the, those water vapors can't rise, condense, pick up, you know, hang on to the particles and form those clouds. All fantastic questions, all great comments, observations on the experiment. So I think that if there's nothing else, Mrs. Brown, I think we're going to go ahead and sign off today. Yeah, there's no other comments coming in, but I will extend a challenge out there for any student who wants to try this um, experiment at home. Uh, I want to know what you think or what happens if you try it just like Hannah did, but use some food coloring. Do you think that cloud will turn a different color? What do you think is going to happen? So something to think about before I toss it back to you, Reed. That's a great challenge. I'd love to hear uh, some of those observations and some of those experiments. Um, you know, what's going to happen with food coloring? What, is a cloud going to be a different color? All great things to ask and something that you can do at home. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today live on YouTube uh, for another episode of Backyard Missions with Inside the Outdoors. My name is Yareed, and for myself and Hannah and everybody at Inside the Outdoors, thank you for joining us today, and hopefully we will see you on the next episode of Backyard Missions. Thank you, everyone.